it's like these um, popular fairy tale endings, you know, and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> Anything that we that we as humans enjoy, we want it to last. I remember coming to Hermanus many times as a child. My my grandparents lived here, and so we would travel all the way from Pretoria to Hermanus and would look forward to the whole year to the December holidays it was like the cherry on the cake you know the very thing that you would strive for for the whole year and then um, eventually you know we, we tackle this long trip and we come all the way through and we come all the way through um, from Pretoria to Hermanus and then when we get through Villiersdorp and eventually on this little road to, to Caledon and then that first sight of the sea you know we would, we would dare one another as children who's going to see the sea first you know it's just enormous anticipation and then you suddenly see it then go and he says Horston view you know it's like when you see that Horston view and um, and that enormous joy that we've got three or four or sometimes even five weeks of, of just Hermanus. You know? and, and I remember as a child, uh, after the first or second day, then suddenly the thought would come that this holiday is going to end, you know, and um, it's already two days less. <laughs> and you know, it's uh, uh, totally unavoidable. You know, the time is going to come, we're going to have to pack our bags again, mm -hmm. and we're going to go back. And it almost spoils the, the holiday, mm -hmm. just that thought, that this good thing is going to end. And so, the reason for our, 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 our um, opportunity that we, we see for this, is just to give um, continuation to a conversation that we believe can never end. You know, sometimes we think God speaks very economically. You know, God's very polite. And He only speaks from the pulpit on a Sunday. And He only speaks, you know, when you really separate yourself unto the Lord. You know, and you've broken through in prayer or in fasting or in intercession. Now God's going to speak to you. But, you know, if you look at Proverbs chapter 1, it says, Wisdom raises her voice at the entrance of the city. You know, and it's, it's just, she's just there. You know, when the moment you tap into truth, it's there. It says in Psalm 19, Day to day pours forth knowledge. Night to night declares wisdom. So there's not a moment of silence, you know, with, with, with the um, technology today, especially uh, I communicate a lot on, 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 the, on Facebook, and we have many Facebook friends from all over the planet, and then suddenly you read on the comments, you know, that this guy's just woken up, that guy's just gone to bed at the same time. And you realize we live in this, this round planet where every moment the sun rises somewhere, and it sets somewhere, you know, and it's really a 24-hour thing, the conversation of God. Is that day to day pours forth knowledge, night to night declares wisdom. That, that, that there's no end to God's communication. And I really, you know, it so um, in, it thrills me to realize that God's conversation is directly aimed at mankind. That we are God's audience. God is not just speaking in a haphazard way, you know. In a sense, He does. He says, Whoever has an ear to hear, let him hear. Yeah. But that word is not just a, a casual word. God's word is very direct. His thoughts are geared towards us. At one point David says, What is man that thou art so mindful of him? David just becomes so overwhelmed with the thought that this omniscient God, this awesome God who, whom the heavens cannot contain, continues to personally think about me, to consider my life, to care for me in little minute details, you know, that, that one wouldn't even bother to, to think about yourself. And you realize how He cares for you while you sleep, while you slumber. And, and to realize that, that God's mind is like the mind of the father of the prodigal son. The father never forsook his son. The son forsook the father. But the, son's, the father's mind was constantly engaged, constantly occupied with his son's return. And I think in, in just in our daily fellowship, there's that reality, you know, that God constantly draws, draws on our return. Mm. And uh, when, when um, David addresses himself, you know, sometimes it's a very good thing to, to speak to yourself. Mm. And in Psalm 116, David says, Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Mm. And I think David, like any of us, often experience an opportunity to lose your cool. Never mind lose your cool, lose your your faith almost. You know, you, you get sometimes so contradicted, so challenged. Yeah. Uh, I had a long chat to my daughter this morning. She's going through to, to, to two uh, 
quite big crises in their life right now. The one is a relationship crisis, the other one is a job situation. And to just have the confidence to share with her that we have a reference that doesn't have to change when the crisis changes. It's not the size of the crisis that determines our reference. And I use the example, I said, you know, when you make a mathematical calculation, the answer to that calculation is already true before you've discovered it, before you have made the calculation. Whether it's a simple answer or the most complicated answer that you can get in mathematics, in the world of mathematics, the most complicated answer has already a true answer. Before you've even tackled the problem, before you've even looked at it, you might be at school and you learn for the first time that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Now the correct answer is a very powerful thing. There's an enormous authority in the correct answer. The wrong answer carries no authority. It carries no consequence. The only possible consequence that the wrong answer can have is in deception. So if we can make a calculation, and that's the bottom line of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a calculation that God made. And the conclusion of this calculation is true whether people believe it or not. It's true before you believe it. Yes. It's not your faith. Yes. Your wow, the penny drops for me. Yes. That doesn't make any difference to the calculation. It just does something to you. It makes a big difference to you. That's where the whole repentance thing comes in. Because my mind is suddenly challenged to think differently. I might have been thinking in this, this direction for years and years and years. And suddenly truth hits my spirit. And you know what? We're designed to respond to truth. Yes. Truth is not new. Even though I hear it for the first time. I might hear it for the first time, but it's not new. It carries an impact that translates in my understanding to a metanoia. It's the Greek word for repentance, to a change of mind. I think differently. Because there's a different authority that cancels all the other arguments, all the other distractions, all the detours. You know, this, this, this place where I've been, this whirlpool of being swept to and fro with different opinions is suddenly challenged at my connection with truth because truth carries its own authority and it's within that authority that God speaks that his voice brings light the entrance of his word brings light and dispels darkness and um, we've said that the gospel of Jesus Christ is a calculation that God made God made a calculation before we were in on the deal before we even heard it you know, I love it where Paul says in Ephesians 2 and verse 5, he says, While we were still dead in our trespasses, mm -hmm. he made us alive together with Christ. Mm -hmm. So something happened to the human race before they heard it, mm -hmm. before they knew about it. Mm -hmm. That's why we proclaim it. Because when we proclaim it, what happens to that same lost, um, uh, troubled, confused human race? Mm -hmm. Faith comes to them. Yeah. Where does faith come from? From God's persuasion. Mm -hmm. God is absolutely convinced. I mean, tomorrow's newspaper is not going to change God's mind for him. My little brother, you are so welcome. T tomorrow's newspaper is not going to challenge God's opinion. It's not going to change God's mind and say, you know, um, uh, I I'm, I'm sorry guys, I've been a little bit too positive about the gospel. I'm going to have to adjust, realign the gospel to make it more palatable. You know, imagine God's predicament with Abraham. When after many years, Sarah still didn't fall pregnant. I mean, God was put on the spot. God was in a situation where he said, you know, maybe I have to recalculate what I spoke to Abraham. Maybe I have to consider new facts that are on the table. Maybe I have to reconsider my whole approach to my vision and my dream for planet Earth. Because Sarah's not falling pregnant. I mean, God in his wisdom chose Abraham and Sarah. And took them to a place where it was absolutely humanly impossible to conceive, to bear a child. Mm -hmm. To reveal to them the shadow revelation of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Of the life that was lost. Of, of Ezekiel's vision when he saw a valley. Not of half dead people. And some of them you can still more or less get to survive. You know, if you get them the right injection and the right um, medication, you might just be able to pull them through. A valley of dead bones. I remember preaching this message once in Zimbabwe um, about a year and a half ago in Bulawayo with, with a group of church leaders. And I was so challenged. Because at that time, uh, it was my sixth visit that year in Zimbabwe. 
and it was impossible to continue to calculate the Zim dollar. It was just absolutely... I mean, I stood at the farm just weeping, looking at the farm laborers, coming into that little farm stall, wanting to buy a bar of soap, mm. and he had to walk out with the other soap, wanting to buy something, uh, because there was nothing in his salary that could buy a slice of bread eventually. And I'm faced with the situation. And I said to those leaders, you know, when God showed Ezekiel the valley of dry bones, yeah. should God not have started somewhere, you know, just before they died? <laughs> you know, can't we just go back, you know, before, before all this, this mess? Can't we just go back in time and try and rescue this, the perishing before they perish? But here they are, beyond help. Absolutely no hope. There's not even a chance that these dry bones, I mean, can you that I, I, I walked for many years in the bush doing safaris there and um, in the in, uh, South Sand Game Reserve adjacent to the Kruger National Park. And how many times, now I remember it vividly when you see a carcass of, of, a, of a buffalo that was eaten by the lion. You know, you can tell whether it, was, it happened last week or last year by how bleached those bones are and how scattered those bones are. You see, when the, when, the, when the hyena set in, they tear this carcass, what's left of it, apart. They clean it out. Then the vultures descend, and the vultures clean out. Every little possible resemblance of the original animal is lost. Those bones are scattered. There's nothing left that resembles the life of that animal. And yet Ezekiel visualizes humanity in their worst state. Not even a little bit of flesh left on that bone. Nothing attractive about that person. Mm. Nothing said, nothing on his grave tomb that says he was a good guy. You know, he lived from this date till that date. Nothing. Just a valley of dry bones. No history attached to that man. And God says to Ezekiel, Can these bones live? Can you imagine Ezekiel hearing God asking a question like that? Can these bones live? And then you think you've got a crisis. <laughs> Can these bones live? And what was Ezekiel's response? You know, he could have said, absolutely no. He could have said that. He could have said, God, please, next question. I mean, it's a stupid question. Impossible, impossible to rescue the situation. But he played safe. And he said, Lord, you know. I said to those pastors in Zimbabwe, I said, you know, as a church, as the church of Jesus Christ, we are confronted with the valley of dry bones. And sometimes we pray neutral prayers. We say, Lord, Thou knowest. <laughs> and how did God respond? Did He say to Ezekiel, now stand back, Ezekiel, and I'm going to show you the most spectacular miracle you've ever witnessed in your life. How did God respond? He said, Ezekiel, you prophesy. Speak to the bones. Say to those bones, live. You see, when we deal with the gospel, we're dealing with the faith of God. We're not dealing with our best interpretation, with our best commentary that we've studied on this verse or that particular scripture. We're dealing with the faith of God. When we tap into the faith of God, we tap into the force of the universe. We tap into the breath of God that holds the galaxies in place. We're not here to try and have a little debate on some scriptural interpretation. We're here to allow the spirit of truth, the spirit of the living God, to quicken our understanding. To quicken our understanding, so that within that quickening, we may understand what Paul said in Romans 1, 7, 16 and 17 when he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation for anyone who has faith. And in verse 17 he tells us where faith comes from. He says, for therein, in this declaration, in this gospel, there is a calculation that God made. God, God made. The, the righteousness of God is revealed. Yes. So if I preach a gospel, any gospel, that does not reveal the righteousness of God, I'm not even touching the power of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not touching the power of God. Because the power of the gospel is a revelation of the righteousness of God. What right God has to say what He says. What right did God have to say to to, to Abraham, I'm going to change your name. I'm going to call you from now on the father of many Jews. No, nations. Nations. What right did God have? What was the righteousness of God? What was Abraham's righteousness? Just yielding to God's righteousness. Say, God, you're right about me. And Abraham made it so me, so personal, that he introduced himself. The next time he introduced himself, his next conversation was, oh, by the way, I've had a main name change. Yeah. Imagine that. Imagine that evening when he gets together for a bright place with his regular friends. He says, guys, by the way, um, I've had a name change. So, um, Abe, what's it going to be? It's going to be Abraham, the father of many nations because he was quickened in his spirit and because he was quickened in his spirit he was able to respond to God you see that's the most powerful thing about faith faith is not an argument that I can academically consent to that I can say okay well that makes sense faith is a download of the power of God in my spirit because I'm human I'm faith compatible because you're human I mean you can use brand new cell phone for the very first time you don't have to wind this cell phone up and eventually you know, after two months it kind of you know start, you start getting all your texts me. The moment you turn that cell phone on and the SIM card is in place, you've got your PIN code in place. Everything that is represented beyond can you imagine the technology that goes behind this little device? The thought, the, the time, the money, the energy, human energy. That and here we are, we just press a little button and send and our text message goes. Can we imagine what goes behind the gospel? You know, you take a little tablet today, a little for medication, whatever it might be. Imagine what's in that tablet. I'm not talking about its um, pharmaceutical ingredient. The time, the study, the research, Mm -hmm. the hours, the years of laboring in the laboratories, trying to to break this this code, trying to understand medication, and now represent it in a little tablet called the Gospel. (laughs) You know, what goes behind? What makes the Gospel of God, the power of God, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, equals the power of God? You know, if we look at light, even today, you know, we talk about light in terms of candle power. I remember when I was a ranger in the bush, we used to do our night safaris with a million candle light, um, spotlight. Mm-hmm. Equaling a mil- million candles. Imagine you can get a million candles to have all of that light focused in one beam. Mm-hmm. When you buy a motor car today, you're so aware of how many horses do I have in this engine? Horse power. We try and parallel power. We try and find a comparison that equals what I, my concept of what I'm engaged with. And yet the power of God, you know, the very power that Paul prays would become a revelation to us in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, according to the working of His power, when He raised Jesus from the dead. Now he says, the power of the gospel. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? That what happened when Jesus was raised from the dead was the power capsuled in the gospel. So the good news is the revelation, the, the declaration of the power of God unto salvation. So when we see man in trouble, we have an answer. We have a remedy. We represent what God has done in Christ to rescue that individual. Doesn't matter where that person is. So can you understand if the enemy could undermine our ministry in in the context of our confidence, making us feeling tossed to and fro, you know, because I've got this thing that I'm striving for and that thing that needs to fall in place and then I need to do this and I need to have that happen. Then all of a sudden he neutralizes my ministry. Because there's something of the quality of my persuasion that is lost in the argument. We started off this morning sharing that the gospel is like a mathematical um, calculation. 
I spoke to my daughter earlier on, Pastor Nutt, and uh, this morning she's going through quite a crisis. And I said to her, you know, when you make a mathematical calculation, whether it's a very simple one, 2 plus 2 equals 4, or the most complicated one that you can have on planet Earth, the principle is the same. There's only one correct answer. Mm. And that answer is correct before you arrive at the conclusion. It's been correct in principle. Before you've studied a note of mathematics. Before you've understood one plus one. You've never understood, maybe you've, you've just, you, you've just uh, never ever been exposed to the, to the calculation principle. Or to the division principle. But it's been true. And yet God comes and He exposes us to a calculation that He has made. And that calculation is called the gospel. The gospel means good news. Good means... To your advantage. Yeah. Good always means to your benefit. Yes. So when the angels announce us he's coming, we bring you glad tidings. <gasps> Ooh, what a relief. <laughs> Imagine they announced the same angels, same moment, said, Planet Earth, this is D Day. This is it, this is disaster day. <laughs> This is the end of your existence on this planet. God is fed up with your sins. God is about to just blow you to smithereens and He's going to start all over on another planet. Did God have a right to do that? Absolutely. But what is the righteousness of God? Because the power of God is the revelation of the righteousness of God. What is God's righteousness? God's belief in His creation. God believes in you. God believes in man's return. God believes in the original blueprint. God did not quit his plan with Abraham when Sarah didn't fall pregnant the first year or the next decade. God did not have to compromise his original intent because of Abraham and Sarah's experience. God did not go back to the old name of Abraham. Said, Abraham, listen, this is a bit embarrassing. You know, we can no longer call you the father of many nations. Mm. I think it's better you just be the father of Islam. Mm. Mm. Paul sat in prison. Most of his followers in Asia forsook him. Do you think Paul had to readjust his gospel? Mm. Paul had to suddenly say, guys, no, sorry, um, I've had it wrong. I've offended a few religious people and I think from now on we're going to have to just change our topic. It's not going to work. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He writes to young Timothy. He says, Timothy, don't be embarrassed about my bangles. Don't be ashamed. Don't allow the pressure of popular opinion to undermine the integrity of the gospel. Let's preserve the integrity of the gospel. And what is the integrity of the gospel? It's a calculation that the maker of the heavens made. Mm. Mm. You see, when God saw value, God saw value in its fullest context. Mm. You know, we attach value to diamonds, to gold, to minerals. Mm. Yes. The greatest value that we can ever establish, establish in a diamond, I believe, is in the token that we have in our Western minds to to make this diamond represent my love for my bride mm. when I engage with her to marry. That's a value beyond its carrot, beyond its mineral worth, when suddenly relationship comes into play. Yeah. And here God comes and He attaches a value to the blood yes, because of one reality, relationship. Mm. God has got nothing else in mind. There's no other agenda in the mind of God but a relationship of absolute innocence your innocence is the highest value in the universe mm. there's no value that you could ever wish to attain to accumulate that can match the value of your innocence because it's only within the context of pure innocence that intimacy can be undefiled mm that intimacy can be enjoyed to the largest extent. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly there where God has brought our understanding to appreciate the gospel. Mm -hmm. It's not us trying to represent some religious phenomenon. 
us trying to win votes for Jesus. You know, stop believing in Buddha. Stop following Islam. Stop following this Christian doctrine. Start following my doctrine. That's not it, guys. We're not here to win votes for our little banner. We're here representing the power of God unto salvation. And how is the power of God demonstrated? In the revelation of the righteousness of God, says Romans 1.17, from faith to faith. Where does faith begin? With God. Hebrews 12 says, He is the author and the finisher, the perfecter of whose faith? Of our faith. So my faith has absolutely no significance outside of Him being the author of it. I can be persuaded about something. I know people that will kill for what they believe, but they believe wrong. Most religious wars are fought around this principle. People totally persuaded and they kill. (laughs) They go and do the very opposite of what the gospel represents. But the faith of God, we're not here trying to score points for the Christian belief. Jesus didn't say in in Mark 11, have faith in God. Even though your translation might say that, even though your translation might have a, a leather cover and it might be gold sprinkled on the pages. Yeah. Jesus never said, have faith in God. In the Greek text it says, have the faith of God. It's a huge difference. It's a huge difference. You see, our big problem, in, even in, in Christianity, why we're so divided, is because we all have our idea. And we fight for our idea, we fight for our doctrine, we fight for our opinion. But what does Paul say? Ephesians 4. There is only one faith. Not two, one faith. (laughs) So whose faith matters most? God's faith. So when I come to the gospel, I come to an understanding that the gospel is the revelation of God's faith. It unveils what Abraham saw. Abraham saw the faith of God. And that faith became his faith. It became his identity. It became his name. He began to declare, I am the father of many nations. 25 years later, Abraham still introduced himself as the father of many nations. And his wife's womb was absolutely barren. Ezekiel, can these bones live? You see, the faith of God is the persuasion of God about planet earth. If we say we live for Jesus, what does it mean? I live for what His name means. His name means the salvation of the world. You know, we can sound very religious and say, Oh, I live for Jesus. But I don't have any understanding of His God. I have no persuasion of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the revelation of God's act of mercy. Of how God acted on mankind's behalf. When were they least deserved it. He loved us while we were as sinful as you get. Loved us. And in that one act, He rescued us. And so now it's the power of God unto salvation. So that calculation is true before we believe it. We've touched on Ephesians 2 verse 5 where Paul says, While we were still dead in our sins. Now you can't get more dead than that. That's about a valley of dry bones as you can imagine. While we were still dead in our sins. There was not even, we were hostile. I mean we, we, we weren't even religious. We were just hostile. So this gospel qualifies the worst kind of human race. He says he did what? He made us, us dead humanity, us rebellious, hostile humanity. He made us alive together with Christ. (laughs) And he raised us up together with Christ. You see, that revelation is the calculation of God. That is what Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. When he says that none of the rulers of this world understood this. If they had the least understanding, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. They did not understand that what happened in the calculation of God represents the human race. They thought they dealt with an individual. God knew they dealt with the human race. God knew that there was one person... And one alone that would represent all of deity and all of humanity in the same person. Jesus has no competition. There is no other name. He says no one comes to the Father. You can come to all kinds of ideas about God through many other names. But no one comes to the Father. 
no one can discover your original father but by him because he is the son of man revealing the son of God no one comes he has no competition Jesus is not sitting nervous checking the stats you know today is the latest stats on how many Muslims are there on planet earth how many Hindus how many Christians oh guys we've got to work we've got to get people motivated to evangelize God has made one calculation it's called the gospel and in the context of the gospel we see what God sees faith comes to us and you know what happens when faith comes to us God's persuasion motivates you yeah. Paul says I'm not ashamed of the gospel yes. because I'm not adjusting my gospel to my prison cell I'm not adjusting my preaching to the situation the circumstances he says in Philippians 4 I've learned the secret I've learned the secret what is the secret? He says to be content. Yes. Content doesn't mean now I'm just putting up with my problems. Mm. Content means super satisfied. Yes. I am super satisfied. Mm. In fact, I'm so content. It's like when you've had a meal. Imagine the meal of your dreams. <laughs> and you've had, I mean, the choicest food. I said to my daughter this morning, you know, when you dish up food from a buffet, you don't put stuff in your plate that you don't like. Mm. You, you put stuff in your plate that, that, that complements your palate. Mm-hmm. You feel comfortable with that. Wow, I can't wait to indulge. Imagine, you've eaten your fill of your favorite food. And someone comes with something totally inferior to your palate. What is the attraction? Absolutely zero. In Proverbs, Solomon writes something so powerful. He says to the hungry, everything that is bitter is sweet but he who is satisfied loathes the honey you see it's such a struggle to get people to sin less while they desire to sin it's like getting a homosexual to stop committing the act maybe for a month maybe for a year but he constantly strives and desires is that man free? he's in absolute bondage Jesus didn't come to add a few rules to the Ten Commandments to make it even more difficult for us to obey. He came with something much more powerful than that. His rescuing had everything to do with the original blueprint revealed in human life in the person of Jesus Christ. He was satisfied, loathes the honey. Honey loses its appeal. The sugar-coated pole loses its appeal when I'm satisfied. God did not design us for a life of frustration. He designed us for total contentment. And when Paul says in Philippians 4, I've learned the secret to be content. That's what he means. Mm -hmm. To be totally super satisfied. Mm -hmm. And he says, you want to challenge my contentment? Let's speak about the two extremes of abundance and of lack mm-hmm. he says my contentment is not touched by either yeah. abundance doesn't have what it takes to add to my contentment mm-hmm. yeah. if something is full it's full yeah. neither abundance nor any definition of lack nor any consciousness of lack can challenge the contentment that he has in mind for us. Mm. Can you see your life and your ministry launched Mm. from that place? Mm. Paul wasn't saying, oh, if I could just have a bigger building, a bigger prison cell at least. Paul's ministry was not measured by the size of his prison cell. Mm. Mm. Neither was it measured by the time that he had to spend there. Mm. Mm. (laughs) People, if we can grasp this, then there's nothing, nothing, nothing that can separate us from the love of God if nothing that 2010 has still to offer still to happen that can separate me from the love of God then the future holds no threat holds no threat then my day is redeemed my life is redeemed my time is redeemed because I am represented in Him The gospel of Jesus Christ is the calculation, is the sum 
total of what God saw when he saw the death of his son when he saw the obedience of his son you see what goes behind this gospel is not just the small historic reference that we have even in the Bible but there's an eternal thought behind this this is before the foundation of the earth I loved you before you were fashioned in your mother's womb I knew you there's an eternity that backs if time is of any relevance eternity exceeds it there's an eternity behind your salvation there's an eternity behind your salvation you see if we are persuaded that we represent in our time on this planet what eternity reveals in Christ then we settle in a position where we can redeem time you see you might dream about a beautiful house that you'd like to possess one day but how do you redeem it if you don't have the money if you can't, cannot secure the bond but when it comes to time God has given us an understanding that unlocks time that frees time from the clutches of despair of hopelessness and we suddenly discover that we are part of God's tapestry you know when Paul writes or Peter writes so beautifully in 1 Peter 3 um, maybe we can just turn there as a reference this morning 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18 for Christ also died for our sins once and for all do you see the finality of that here's God's calculation again once and for all final Mm -hmm. (coughs) the just for the unjust so that he might bring us to God having been put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit now just that verse and then I want you to to jump to chapter 4 verse 1 therefore you see where the therefore comes from Mm -hmm. therefore verse 18 says for Christ also died for our sins once and for all the just for the unjust Mm -hmm. it says therefore since Christ has suffered in the flesh Mm -hmm. arm yourselves with the same mind You see the word repentance literally means in the Greek the word is two words meta nous or metanoia as it's written in the context. Meta nous means together with mind. Mm-hmm. The question is whose mind? Mm-hmm. There are many minds. Yeah. So what is true repentance? It is to come under the persuasion of the mind of God. Mm-hmm. Because the spirit, he says, no man knows a man's thoughts. I mean that's that's deep <laughs> guys that's deep but the spirit of the man he searches his inner thoughts as in water face answers to face and here God comes and by his spirit he reveals his eternal thought what is man that thou art so mindful of him the very thing that occupies the mind of God it's not some little brush over, little casual, mm. but the very thought that occupies the mind of God comes to us through the revelation of Christ. Mm. Not necessarily just Christ in history, I thank God for the historic record, but the awesome revelation of Christ in you, the tabernacle of God, mm. that God found a home on planet Earth, not in a building beautifully decorated by man's artistic skills up in the human body your body the temple of God God finding expression in your person God able to communicate in your person the very character of your makeup the life of your design Mm. you see now when I read 1 Corinthians 13 I don't read a beautiful poem on love I don't read some wonderful display window 
parable on the love of God. I look into the mirror with an unveiled understanding that as He is, so am I in this world. That God is able to download His faith, the persuasion of His love. Because faith worketh by love. Suddenly faith finds an energy that is beyond human argument. It's the love of God that constrains when Paul. The most beautiful calculation that Paul ever recorded was in 2 Corinthians 5.14. In 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, God, Paul says, One has died for all, equals, therefore all have died. But what does he say before that? He says, the love of Christ constrains me. Isn't that wonderful? You see, people can find a doctrine and attach value to the doctrine and become very persuaded about the doctrine and, and fight for the doctrine. But if it's not the love of God, then I'm not speaking the truth in love. I might speak the truth, but there's no importation. You see, love imparts. Anything beyond that is called rape. Love imparts. When, love, when the love of God awakens my spirit to know the spirit of God, the deep things of God, then I can no longer be casual about it. Then I can no longer just look at the surface and find another scripture to contradict that one and another scripture to support my belief. But then I discover the love of God because there's a calculation and there's only one correct answer. If one has died for all, then all have died. And Paul doesn't just see that academic, doesn't see that just as another doctrine that he wants to add to the Christian philosophy. But he sees it as the revelation of the love of God. Do you see the revelation of God is the revelation of His love. If you have a problem with the, the law and grace, just look at it this way. What supports the law of law? It's called works, performance. What supports the law of grace? The law of faith. It's called worth. Look at the difference. Not your performance, your worth. Yes. The best scripture, the best parable we can use for that is when Jesus says, Take no thought of your life. Can you see it in the light of our conversation this morning? Yeah. There's no more worthy thought that you can take of your life yes. than the thought of your original worth yes. that is redeemed in Christ. Yes. Any other thought is an inferior value that you're placing upon your life. What shall I eat? What shall I drink? What shall I put on? Where shall I live? It's an inferior thought. He says the whole world finds themselves trapped in this whirlpool of survival. He says, take no thought. And then he gives us a little example. He says, consider. And the word consider means to ponder. Consider the birds. And the lilies, the flowers of the field. He says, not even Solomon. Solomon, representing the wealthiest kingdom of that time. Can you imagine his wardrobe? Can you imagine Solomon's wardrobe? I have a few rich friends. I get lost when I check in their wardrobes. I mean, there's sometimes, two, three times a day, they change clothes, shoes, decorations. I mean, it's, can you imagine Solomon's wardrobe? The silk, the embroidery, the gold, the purple. Not even Solomon in all his wealth can match one minute little flower. The attention to detail. I love nature. And um, here's a little hint, you know, if you have a pair of binoculars and you want to look at a flower, turn it around. That binocular becomes a microscope. And suddenly this little minute flower opens and you see into it. You see the way the insect sees it. Can you imagine the attention to detail in one flower? Can you imagine the attention to detail in your salvation? He saved us to the uttermost. He saved us so that we may participate in the divine nature. So I'm not just participating in some replica. You see, if you wear a Rolex watch and it's a replica, but you don't know it, it's still a replica. It's still not the real thing. But if you find out that it's false, take it off. You say, man, I've had enough. I've been deceived for long enough. That's what happened when the prostitute and the tax collector 
saw Jesus. Mm. Yeah. They saw the truth. Yeah. And you know what the truth did? It revealed the lie. Yes. Yeah. Said, I'm done with my past life. Sure. Yeah. I'm not here wearing a replica yeah. yes. of the life of my design. Mm. I'm done with it. Amen. Stripped of it. Mm-hmm. I'm embraced in Him with unveiled face as in a mirror. Yeah. And mirror there, I see the attention to detail the master artist at work mm. how he decorated my life sure. how he knitted me together in my mother's womb mm. to find a voice to find a vehicle to find an expression that would be consistent with the original thought mm. religion is such a poor replica it's such a poor replica So when Peter says, since therefore, 1 Peter 4 verse 1, since therefore Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. You know, for many years I did a safari business in the Sabi Sand Game Reserve. And we were taking guests for three nights, minimum of three nights. And we take them on walks. And almost every day, on foot, we encountered lion and elephant. But you know what gave us confidence? Two things. Our knowledge of the bush, because I had a tracker with me that that grew up there. He taught me what books couldn't teach. And I carried a four five eight caliber rifle. (laughs) Now, a four five eight caliber rifle has a round that can stop a charging elephant in its tracks. It's like a full stop. I didn't fire one shot with it in our walks. But because I carried that weapon, it turned our dangerous walk into an adventure. Life is dangerous. I remember December a year ago, I married a couple in a shark cage in, in um, Hansby. We did the marriage ceremony on the boat and then we actually had to go into the shark cage with our little placards because you can't talk, you, your mouth's occupied breathing from the bottle. And so we held up our little placards. You want him? You've got him. <laughs> I said to them, you know, not one of us tested the strength of the shark cage before we got into this cage we believed the word of the operator that this cage turns a very dangerous environment into an adventure life's dangerous marriage very dangerous (laughs) how do I turn my marriage into an adventure how do I turn my life on planet earth into the adventure of God's dream. God's dream is not survival. Yeah. God did not redeem Israel to get lost in the wilderness. Yeah. God only has one dream. He swore by himself. That's that's heavyweight oath. He says, I will flood the earth with the knowledge yeah. of my glory. Yes. Mm-hmm. Even as the waters cover the sea there's no other glory that is worth living for yeah. there's no other glory that is worth studying for yeah. there's no career choice that can match this worth yeah. rivers of living water gushing out of your innermost being yeah. God is the source of your life rivers of living water yeah. I want to just quickly conclude with, with 1 Peter chapter 4 so the calculation is that Christ suffered for us once and for all. And there was enough in, enough in His suffering, enough in His death, to rescue the human race. And so now Peter say, suggests that we arm our thoughts. You see, the moment I took up that weapon, my guests had confidence to walk with me. They might have never known me before. They might have just met me an hour ago. And the next hour, we are faced with a lion, a real lion, not, 
Not a caged one. Not a bottled lion. The real thing. Or the elephant that seems to be a little bit upset because we're interfering with his spots. But the confidence comes from that weapon. And the man carrying it. And if Peter says, arm yourselves. You want to carry the best armor to make your life more than just a good survivor. But the most attractive, most adventurous, most fulfilled, satisfied life you can imagine. Arm yourselves with this mind. That what happened there, the revelation of the cross was sufficient. Once and for all. He need never die again. I never need to repeat again like I did under the old system. Repeatedly bringing my sacrifice. Repeatedly bringing my, my, my um, performance. Trying to bring my performance into play. What happens of our boasting? It's excluded. Yes. Also of our regret. Our regret's also excluded. Because it comes from the same law, the law of performance. Romans 3.27. He says, by which law? The law of works, he says, no. The law of faith. Mm. The faith of God. Mm. And so, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Mm. Now here's a calculation. Romans chapter 6 verse 11 Consider yourselves to have died to sin <coughs> I said to the this morning when we woke up because sometimes we confronted with all kinds of symptoms I said to her, you know if we can make a calculation the word consider in the Greek is the word lokitsomai it literally means to make a calculation to which there can only be one logical conclusion so what is my calculation? What backs my calculation? The faith of God. Yeah. God's calculation. Otherwise, I'm just trying to dream up things, but it's not true. And if something's not true, it's powerless. Yeah. Unless I give it power and it becomes deception. Mm. But it's powerless. But the truth is powerful. Mm. So what is the calculation that, that I make? If I can consider my life to be dead to sin, I can consider my body dead to disease. Yes. Mm. Dead to disease. Mm. You see, if we don't understand this level of teaching, if there's an inferior level of teaching in my understanding, then obviously there's an open door for the enemy to sneak in on me. But if I can come to that understanding that my body is the temple of God, and as much as my life is dead to sin, I'm dead to disease. Disease has no authority to attach itself to my body. It's like when you go to a parking lot, but the parking lot is full. Move on. Yeah. So if sin comes and knocks on my door, if disease comes and knocks on my door, the parking lot's full. There's no room for sin to occupy my life. There's no place for this thing to park its presence. Because I'm delivered from it. So I'm arming my mind. Do you see now the renewing of my mind is not something that I do for my Christian convenience. But it's something that I understand that harnesses my inner being with the truth of God. That empowers me to stand before this world. Never mind before my congregation. Before this world in the knowledge of I'm not ashamed of this gospel. Because I represent this gospel. I represent what this world needs right now. I represent it in my person. In my being. I represent the answer. The solution to mankind's humanity's despair. It's represented in you. And then Peter says it so beautifully. And I'll close with this. He says, verse 2, 1 Peter 4. So as to live the rest of your time in the flesh. No longer driven by the lusts of the flesh. Mm. But the will of God. Yes. You see what, what our life is really all about at this moment. Is this threshold that we're standing. We're standing right now this moment of time on a threshold. And what's laying ahead of us? The rest of our time in the flesh. Yes. That's all. You know that that's more important than your goals? So often we reduce faith to goal setting. And you know, it's just a a natural law. It's again, sowing to reap, building bigger barns, and then Jesus says, Oh, look at the birds. What drives the bird? Only one thing. Not my works, my worth. I don't have to sow and reap and build bonds. But my worth, Jesus says, take no thought. Because in all my thought taking, 
I couldn't come up with a large enough calculation to feed the multitudes. Mm. My budget is too small. He says, but what do you have? Yes. What do you have? And when I realize what I have, mm. who I am, I say, Lord, give me the nations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Don't give me a big ministry, Lord. Mm. A lovely, comfortable congregation of about 50 people or maybe 500 people. It's not the measure of my ministry. Mm. Give me the nations. Yes. For one has died for all. And the love of Christ constrains me. Mm. Paul goes beyond the boundaries of that prison house. Beyond the boundaries of his own time in the flesh. This is not only my presence, but much more in my absence. Discover the full extent, the height and the length and the breadth and the depth of the love of God and your salvation. For it is God who works in you both too. Well, so the rest of the time in my flesh, motivated by the will of God, the drive of God, the drive of God, to tell others. Yes. A young pastor asked me the other day, how do I define full-time ministry? And I had a very simple answer. I said it is to full time enjoy him yes. and communicate him. Yes. That's full time ministry. Full time enjoying him and communicating him. You know, so often we reduce ministry to all the models that we bombarded with on TV yeah. and through this Bible school training and that certificate that I'm striving for. But when ministry becomes the opening of the fountain. Mm. in my spirit mm. there in the bush where we did our walking safaris all the rangers knew exactly the layout of the area where we were able to access and all the little roads and all the dams had names but you know that dam was more than its name not one of the animals who drank from that water knew the name. Mm-hmm. We attach so much value to the banner, mm-hmm. to the name of our ministry or our denomination, mm-hmm. while people die of hunger and thirst. Mm-hmm. Rivers of living water, mm-hmm. the fountains of life, mm-hmm. engaging in the thought of God, allowing Him to prompt my life. So that my life can just be that fountain that can touch someone today with an SMS. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father.